Good evening. Thanks to everybody for joining us tonight and welcome to our second town hall specifically related to COVID. Uh, I want to introduce myself. I'm Shauna Tommy. I'm the executive director at Crowfoot Village Family Practice. And I'd like to introduce the panel of people I have with me tonight. Uh, so guys, uh, when I say your name, maybe just give these folks a wave so they know who you all are. Um, so in no particular order, we have Esmond Wong, pharmacist at CBFP. We have Dr. Ian Johnston, Dr. Karen Siegel, Nurse Alex Scott, Dr. Lynn Gillis, and Dr. Chris Bachmuel. We also have some folks managing our chat in the background. So if you have questions tonight, please feel free to post them in the chat. Dr. Janet Reynolds, Dr. Casey Miller, Dr. Aaron Gore Hickman, and Dr. Wendy Stefanik are all answering your questions as we speak. So please feel free to use that. Uh, the other thing that I should mention is that if this is your first time tuning in to one of our town halls, we actually have done a couple and one specifically related to COVID. So if you haven't checked that out yet, you can go to our website at www.cvfp.com and there's a link right there. You can click it and you can watch all the sessions we've done already and that's where future sessions will be posted. So I'm gonna jump in with the first question that, that came to us, which is about what I do if I have a health concern. Uh, it related to, if it's non-urgent, should it be put on the back burner? And really that gives me a chance to speak to what we're doing at CVFP right now, which is we're still providing you with all the care that you need. So if you feel you have something going on, whether it is urgent or not, I would encourage you just to give us a call and call us first. We're here for you, we're your medical home. Typically what will happen is our staff will work with you and we'll book you a phone appointment to start. And that might be a call from the registered nurse, one of our team members or your family physician. And when we do that call, we'll decide on any next steps that need to be taken, including potentially bringing you into the clinic where we have safe procedures in place to see you in person. With that said, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Lynn Gillis. Lynn's gonna chat with us about some general questions that came relate, relating to COVID-19, the virus. Lynn, take it away. All right. So um, I'll try not to repeat too many things that you guys have probably already heard, but I think I'll just start with some really quick uh, briefs into um, uh, transfer of the virus because some of the questions received were around that. Um, so, as I think most of you know, uh, the virus enters uh, our bodies through mucous membranes, so that means mouth, nose, and eyes. It primarily occurs um, during uh, close contact and, and prolonged contact, um, <laughs> although for different people have different definition of what prolonged is, so that can even include a handshake. Um, spread is through respiratory droplets. So that means for most cases through coughing, sneezing, uh, some people spit when they talk. So uh, it can be transferred that way as well. The majority of people don't actually sneeze or cough more than two meters. Um, and that's where our social distancing comes into play. Uh, the virus is, uh, is actually a heavy virus, um, which is different than, for example, the measles virus, which is quite light. So it is susceptible once it gets in the air to gravity, uh, which then of course pulls it down so that it lands on the floor or other surfaces that it comes in contact with. Uh, there are um, situations that are not common. So it's not impossible for the virus to last in the air for longer periods of time, but those are very specific um, situations that you would find more often in places, uh, special treatment um, places in the hospital. Um, so specifically um, addressing questions about being in the community, being in your grocery store, walking down the street, um, a cough uh, is susceptible to gravity and the virus stays in the air truly for just uh, seconds. Um, the virus, uh, I think um, probably again, most of you have heard this, but the virus can remain on objects for hours. It can also remain on, um, on certain materials for a few days. However, uh, 
the, the research on this does suggest that the viral load on these materials does actually have to be large to infect someone. Um, and, and the actual load is unknown. And it really is thought that um, that the type of transfer to happen on a material over long periods of time is likely not a huge contributor to the spread of the virus. Um, so a person, uh, could a person um, be infected? Uh, we had a question about a person that uh, is COVID or I think what they probably meant is has symptoms of COVID or maybe doesn't have symptoms yet, but is COVID positive? Could they transfer the virus by touching uh, a coffee lid, for example, uh, in um, maybe one of our drive throughs I suspect is where the question was going. So technically, yes, if that server coughed or sneezed and the droplet landed on the lid and then you put that to your mouth or you touched that droplet and then touched uh, your nose or your eyes. Um, so the technical answer, I guess, would be yes. However, first of all, we have guidelines in place. Nobody is supposed to be working. We all know this. If they have symptoms, right? If you have symptoms, you stay home. If you are COVID positive, you stay home. The people working in all our food industries are instructed to uh, wear protection, which I think Dr. Johnston will talk a little bit about, um, but uh, that includes masks, it includes um, washing hands and of course uh, gloves. So we have things in place to try and keep you safe with respect to um, that particular question. I guess at the end of the day if you're still worried that, um, that that's a risk you could always transfer your coffee into your own mug and then throw, discard the lid and then after that wash your hands and you're good to go because we do know that the virus is susceptible to um, cleaning solutions. Um, so I, I did also want to just mention, um, because I talked about that in contact, in close contact, and I mentioned earlier being uh, that contact uh, is usually in a prolonged situation where we see most of the um, infections occurring. There's one study that um, I think uh, supports this well, it, that was in a healthcare facility that had an outbreak um, all of the healthcare workers that uh, uh, did become infected uh, were investigated and were found that all of them had been in contact with a COVID positive patient within less than two meters away for over 15 minutes. So anybody that did not was more than two meters away or less than 15 minutes were not positive with COVID. So they all had to be close and for 15 minutes and they also were not wearing any type of protection. Um, so I, that just reinforces that, but you know, use the guidelines that are in place and for the most part, they, they work very, very well. Um, I think there was a question around food contamination. Um, there's no evidence that COVID can be transmitted um, uh, orally through food. Um, there's also some questions I'm going to address around cough. The, there was a question around how long uh, patients um, with COVID would have a cough. First of all, not all patients that get COVID have a cough. So about 40% of patients um, that are infected with COVID will have a cough. And there is no data that I've um, been privy to that suggests that there's the particular length in time of a post-COVID cough, it's likely more dependent on the patient's personal characteristics, whether they, what their um, comorbidities are, and probably if they're susceptible to having long, prolonged coughs after other viruses um, that they've been exposed to in the past, um, then that may be the same situation with this COVID-19. Um, so, uh, it, it, it's something to be mindful of. It, it's actually somewhat common to see um, post-viral coughs that can last as long as six to eight weeks. And that's not just with COVID, that's with um, there are many viral infections that, uh, that we can be um, in contact with. Um, so it's, if that's the only symptom that's left, then it's really more of an annoyance than anything. 
Um, there's no good data. Um, one of our respirologists in the city have um, taught, spoken to this um, about using puffers in patients that do not have um, lung uh, comorbidities. So certainly asthma and COPD patients, uh, they should stay on their puffers, uh, particularly if their um, disease is well controlled. And But for patients who are not in that situation and have, don't have puffers usually used, there's actually no um, research to suggest that they're helpful for that post-viral cough and that we really shouldn't be giving patients um, puffers in those situations. There is actually some evidence that um, simple things like honey can actually be effective for cough and then using things like good hydration and lozenges and things like that. Um, as far as whether you should return to work, um, Again, um, one of our respirologists in the city um, tried to address this at a webinar on Monday. Um, first of all, you should review with your family physician or, or, or a physician before going back to work if you still have symptoms. But what she did say was that if you had, if you're positive with COVID and you had symptoms which were likely more than just a cough and all your symptoms have improved, you feel well and you're just left with a post viral cough. Um, and that is typical for you in previous situations of illness, that you likely are in a situation where you could return to activity and work. But again, review that with your physician. The people that, that we shouldn't be saying that to though would be um, those that are immunocompromised because we do know that this, um, these groups of people uh, are infectious for longer periods of time than, than the rest of us. So, um, so that wouldn't pertain to them. Um, I think that everything uh, that I want to say at this point in time, I'll hand it back to Shauna. Thanks, Lynn. So you've talked a lot about symptoms and I actually think it's a it's a confusing topic for people. So thanks for shedding some light on that. We had a specific question around runny noses and is a runny nose a symptom of COVID? People have runny noses for many reasons, allergies and all sorts of things, especially at this time of year. Um, Chris, can you speak to the runny nose as a symptom? Sure. Um, so runny nose or sinus congestion um, is in fact um, a symptom of, of COVID. Uh, it's one of the possible symptoms. Many people don't have it, but certainly you can. Uh, the tricky thing is that, uh, particularly this time of year, we're starting to get into allergy season, and lots of people have allergies, runny noses, congestion, um, and may in fact have that all year long. So how do you tell the difference? And what I'd like to do is kind of separate those uh, that question out into two parts. And the first one is from your own perspective. You know, if you have um, either new runny nose right now, um, then that could be a symptom of COVID. And um, there we recommend that you go online uh, to the Alberta Health uh, Self-Assessment Tool or, or call 811, because um, that's a new symptom. Or if you have a regular un, you know, underlying runny nose and all of a sudden it starts getting a lot worse, um, then that could be a COVID symptom and there you know, that should be checked out. On the other hand, um, lots of people have allergies, they have runny noses all the time. So um, you shouldn't be concerned about COVID if you always have your typical runny nose, you know what it feels like and it's always there, hasn't really changed. Um, I would recommend that you fully treat as much as possible that runny nose. So, you know, if you do have allergies using things like antihistamines, using things like neti pot or sinus rinses, um, and, and at the same time, you know, if you've used a cortisone nasal spray, for example, then right now, make sure you use it regularly so you minimize those symptoms. Um, both for the sake of if you're wanting to go out and be with people and they might very well question you and that I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and the other thing also is that if your own um, lining of the, the mouth and nose um, is as healthy as possible, um, then potentially you would be a little bit less likely to develop infections, including possibly COVID. So, so do treat your allergies fully, do treat any runny nose you have as, as much as you can but only be concerned about COVID currently if you usually don't have a run, runny nose and now you do, or if it's clearly worse than the typical. Now that's kind of, you know, from your end of things. So mo mo most of the time, if you have an allergy runny nose, you probably don't need to worry about it. However, other people are going to worry about it and will comment to you 
uh, and will give you glares. Um, so they're certainly trying to, um, I mean, try maybe wearing a mask if you're going out in public, um, trying to treat it as much as possible. And it turns out, you know, if you called um, a healthcare facility right now, they would absolutely take that seriously. If you called 811, my understanding is, and this includes from some conversation I had even today um, with patients in our practice uh, around symptoms to, um, for COVID. If you talk to 811 to public health and say, look, I've had this runny nose for a month or two or five months, um, they might well uh, treat that differently. Um, so if you always have a runny nose and say, well, I have a runny nose, they wouldn't necessarily send you for testing for COVID. Whereas if it's quite recent, um, then they might. So they would take that um, into account. Um, in our own practice as well, if you have a runny nose, we're going to take that into account as well. I mean, so um, we need to be quite careful in around uh, anybody who comes through the office, and that includes staff. So if you have symptoms, we want to know about that. If that includes a long-standing runny nose, we want to know about that. And then we can work with you. Usually what would happen if you need to be seen in person for something, um, then you'd have a conversation first over the phone with one of the physicians to decide, can we bring you in under a regular visit perhaps? Or we do every day have um, a designated physician um, who looks after patients who might actually have COVID or COVID symptoms. And there we use additional protective gear. Um, so certainly don't hesitate to call if you need help, but recognize that even with long-standing runny nose, our staff are going to flag that for a conversation with the physician because we need to be quite careful. So from your own perspective, it may not be a serious thing unless it changed recently, um, but from the perspective of the public and perspective of healthcare, um, we are going to want to know about those symptoms and to some extent how long that has been if it's changed recently. Um, and we're going to take that uh, into consideration for the safety of, you know, everybody around. Shauna. Thanks, Chris. You, uh, you actually gave me a great segue because you referred to uh, personal protective equipment or PPE. And this is definitely a big topic with our patients. Uh, lots of questions coming in. Uh, I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Ian Johnston, who's going to talk to us a little bit more about the to mask or not to mask questions and all the things that came in to us. Thanks, Shauna. Uh, and I, I see that Dr. Ward has signed in online. Hello, Dr. Ward. Thank you for coming along. Uh, nice to have you on the on the team. It looked like it was when Norm walked into into Cheers uh, bar. Everyone just sort of said hi. Anyway, I, I digress. So I'm going to talk a little bit about PPE, which is personal protective equipment. And certainly I did touch on this last week and I've seen some stuff while I've been out um, at going to the grocery store, going to Costco and so on over the last couple of weeks. I just wanted to, to mention. Uh, so essentially, I'm going to try and say, how do you keep yourself? How do you keep others safe when you go to the grocery store. So first of all, what I'd like you to do is pick up your phone and download the Alberta Trace Together app. Now, there's a few issues with the, with the Apple one, which is what I have, but they're going to fix it. I've been promised by the public health people. Um, so we should have it. We should make sure it's running on our phone. Um, we're gonna wash our hands and we're gonna go out. Uh, while you're out, we want you to wear a mask. And there was some questions about, you know, how do I put a mask on, how do I do it properly? The CDC website, so that's the Centers for Disease Control in the United States, has actually got a really helpful how-to website. It's even got a video with the Surgeon General showing how to make a really simple, basic uh, mask out of a t-shirt and a couple of elastic bands. It's linked on the CVFP website. So you go to cvfp.com and you look for the COVID-19 drop down and uh, click on the, the links there and you'll uh, get taken to that. It also has one about how to clean things in your house, um, which is useful information. So we're gonna wear a mask. Why are we gonna wear a mask? Because we might be asymptomatically transmitting COVID. We might feel fine, but we might be transmitting it. So in order to keep those in the community, the people with uh, poorer health conditions, for example, that maybe isn't, aren't in as good shape as ourselves, we want to keep them safe. So we want us to wear, we want everyone to wear masks when they can't physically distance. If you can physically distance, you know, if you can stay two metres away from other people. So like when I take my kids out for a scooter ride in the park, I'm not wearing a mask. When I'm going to the grocery store, I'm wearing a mask. Um, and what I've been doing is essentially just a, a buff, which is a thing I use when I go skiing, 
uh, and it's basically just doubled up over my face, but uh, that's one way of doing it. There's, as I say, lots of recipes online and the CDC website's a good place to go to get started um, with how to do that. So you're wearing your mask. You notice I haven't mentioned gloves. I'm seeing lots of people wearing gloves. Now, when do I wear gloves? I wear gloves every day at work because every day at work I'm doing things where I'm getting my hands dirty. So what do I do? I wash my hands, I put gloves on, I do whatever dirty thing it is, whether that's an a intimate exam, a rectal exam, for example, or whether I'm doing a procedure where I know I'm going to get blood or something else on my hands. Um, I do that, I then take the gloves off, put them in the garbage and I wash my hands. So the problem about people going to do that in the grocery store thinking they've got clean hands because they're wearing gloves, they're actually just spreading things around. So, and it's limiting your ability to, to wear gloves. I had to go to a hardware store to fix a pipe on, uh, on Saturday and I was standing in line at Lowe's and I was super impressed that everyone was staying two meters apart. Lots of people were wearing masks. A couple of people in line in front of me were wearing gloves and the guy at the chat, the desk was offering hand sanitizer. And they were like, oh no, I've got gloves on. No, you just walked into the store and spread whatever was on your hands around the store. So please stop wearing gloves. Um, they seem to be littering parking lots around the grocery stores and so on, just, just not, not necessary, okay? Um, Next, what else? So that's where, so we've got our uh, clean hands, we're, we've got our mask on. Making sure when you're putting your mask on that you put it on and that once it's on, you don't touch it. If you do touch it, you should be washing your hands again. So when it comes time to take them off, so you've gone around the grocery store, you've got all your groceries, whether you've got some hand sanitizer in the car that you can use to wash your hands, take your mask off without touching your face. Uh, and then wash your hands again. If you don't have them, then you go home and you get in the house and you, um, uh, you wash your hands at home. Questions about groceries. So since the last one of these we did, I've been fortunate enough to have uh, listened to a couple of our local infectious disease specialists talking on this subject. Uh, now, what have they said? So yes, it can live on surfaces under optimal conditions. What are optimal conditions? Optimal conditions are when the, what I would essentially call a large droplet, so you've literally just coughed out a big thing, and it's living in that thing quite happily. It's not going to be sitting on your peanut butter like that. So when you come home from the grocery store, you can comfortably unload your groceries, put them in your cupboards, get rid of your bags, wash your hands and you're done you can get on with your life okay so try and hopefully that helps reassure people helps people get on with their lives in a little bit more of a, a simplistic fashion um the hopefully that answers the question about meat i did see that uh, someone was concerned about um eating beef for example coming from the meat packing uh, plants um dr stefanik's advice is very simple clear advice about safe uh, safe cooking and making sure that uh, meat is properly cooked and so on so you're not getting something else um, but certainly the, the risk of someone from Cargill having managed to infect the meat packaging and for it to have made, it, made its way through the supply chain into your house, I wouldn't spend any time wor uh, wor worrying about that one. Um, there was only one other thing I wanted to mention with the relation to that about how, um, you know, so we're all going back to work communal bathrooms and so on. Someone had sent in a really cool picture of these Dyson uh, hand dryers and how they're potentially aerosolizing things. And yeah, they probably are, but you know what they're going to aerosolize? They're going to aerosolize clean hand water because you've just washed your hands and you've gone into the hand dryer. I wouldn't spend any time spent, uh, worrying about that. The, the most important take home, so um, the study that Dr. Gillis mentioned earlier, one of the, uh, the infectious disease doctors was mentioning that on Monday. 15 minutes within two meters of someone that was infected. It's quite difficult to then be, to, to get, to catch this in that respect. You have to be quite close contact with someone who's got it for quite a long time. Um, so therefore don't worry. The most important thing he said is, if we're all washing our hands, everything will be fine. The Trace Together app is to try and help with everybody to, um, uh, tr help everybody to, make sure that we're um, 
finding new cases so that we can get those folks to stay at home, test anyone that they've been in contact with and know where the virus is. It's very safe, I think, to start reopening uh, everything right now because we're in a position where the hospitals are, are ahead of the game. I was under the um, position where I may have been called back into hospital. I'm very pleased to say that I found out today that's not necessary. The team at the hospital say that they've got this covered. Um, Obviously, we're worried, you know, what happens at second waves and third waves, but we're going to keep an eye on that. But you guys have done an awesome job in flattening the curve, and we're just going to continue to do that. I think that's all that I had for now. Dr. Reynolds has just sent me a, task, a text message saying that there's a question about plastic bags. Um, so can you let them sit for a few days before reusing them? I think you can, because essentially the the reality being that I just said that these, this thing is very difficult to put, you know, if you've coughed on your hand and then touched the touch the bag, then maybe it's there, uh, but you're not doing that because you're, you're wearing a mask and you're coughing into your sleeve uh, and you're washing your hands. And so I, I don't think you need to worry too much about um, reusing grocery bags. I don't think this is a time to ruin the planet with uh, with too much plastic uh, going into, into landfill. I think that's probably all I've got for the moment, Sean, but um, hopefully any questions I can uh, address as we go along. Yeah, I think just one thing to be crystal clear about, Ian, because we had a lot of questions about, again, food and groceries, lots of people asking about how long I should leave them in my garage before I bring them in the house. So what you've said tonight is you don't need to leave them in your garage. You can bring them right into your house and put them away. Yeah, so I, I, I specifically, I knew this question was coming, so I specifically asked the infectious disease specialist this on Monday night, and he basically said, we do not need to worry about this. Um, it's wash your hands, put them in your cupboard and get on with your life. Wash your hands. Keep, essentially, is all he said. Hand washing is important. You don't need to keep them in your garage. You can just put them in your cupboards and get on with things. Great. Thank you so much. And again, um, you, you kind of segued into where we're headed. It's almost like we have a plan here. Um, the next thing I want to move to is to talk about self-isolation. And we've had questions about self-isolation itself and things like, you know, are we opening up too soon? Uh, people have concerns about that and what that looks like. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Karen Siegel to speak to the topic of self-isolation and, and what, uh, what we are thinking about uh, the reopen. Thanks, Shauna. Um, so there's a few different kinds of questions here. Uh, so the first one that I'm going to address is about uh, travel. So somebody had asked about going uh, out of province to another province to travel to see family. And this is a bit of a tough one, but I, I would start by just saying that public health is still recommending that people avoid non-essential travel. Um, the idea here is that we, if we're asymptomatic but are carrying a virus, we don't want to take it into another province. And similarly, we don't want to bring it back into our province when we, when we come back. Um, but for people, if you for some reason do have to travel, if there's a, a major illness in a family or something like that, um, just remembering all the things that we, we keep reiterating about physical distancing, about washing your hands, about being careful how you travel, traveling alone or with somebody that you're in a household with already. Uh, there was another question about, as you said, Shauna, about uh, reopening and there's concern about we've been isolating for so long, uh, it all seems fast that we're opening up, should we be concerned uh, and is there concern for a second wave? So just to be clear about this, so the main purpose of staying home was to try to reduce the speed of spread of the virus. So as Ian had pointed out, uh, we, have, we have quite successfully so far sort of flattened the curve uh, so that our health system has been able to keep up with the demand. So uh, the number of hospital visits, the number of people in the ICU has not overwhelmed our health system. Um, so should we be concerned about a second wave? Well, yes, to some degree, but that's why we're opening things up in stages. So as you know, the first, the first bit here is about opening up um, healthcare providers that maybe were deemed non-essential. So things like dentists and physiotherapists, chiropractors, and they're not just opening up business as usual. So they also have to follow guidelines that are put out by Alberta Health, Alberta Health Services about the physical distancing, about cleaning their surfaces, um, about wearing protective equipment and that sort of thing. So we're not just going from zero to 60, we're, we're making small changes. And then that's why there's time between the stages. So the idea is, okay, let's see what this looks like in a couple of weeks. Do we have a major second wave or things sort of being um, blown out of proportion or blown up? And do we have to pull back or just we delay a second stage? So that's, that's um, where that's coming from. The other part of that I'd say, which feeds into the next question is a little bit about 
personal decision making in all of these scenarios. So the next question was about um, going to a dentist. Is it net, because we've been closed up for a couple of months, uh, is it safe to go to the dentist for an hour's cleaning? Um, and uh, what's what you know? What do we need to worry about? And so I would say that you're. We, we all need to think about our own personal situations and what the risk might be for us. So if we're a 25 year old, completely healthy person, we call up the dentist and, and we're very comfortable with the things that they're doing, by all means, go and get your teeth cleaned. Um, on the other hand, if you're 75 years old and you have diabetes and you have high blood pressure and maybe you're a little bit more leery, it's, it hasn't been that long since you had your teeth cleaned, it, it might be okay to delay that and it might be important for you to do that. So I'd sort of think about what's my own personal risk in this situation. Um, similarly, the next question uh, was about somebody uh, wanting to go hiking. So they're 70 years old, sounds like they're quite well because they're walking and hiking frequently. Um, they've been distancing, but they know that some of their friends haven't been doing quite the same. Uh, is it okay to go hiking uh, when it seems difficult to maintain the two meters, that sort of thing? So, I mean, ideally, we would still maintain the two meters. Um, obviously, the, the physical exercise, that's good for you. Um, but it's, again, a bit of a question of risk. So um, if you're 70 and you've got diabetes and you've got other health conditions, maybe not a great choice. You might choose to do it with one friend on a street. Um, but if you're otherwise very healthy and you can maintain the um, strategies that we ask you to do, then it's then it's a reasonable thing to do. Uh, the last question about self-isolation was a little bit different, um, but I think it's worth addressing because it's a little bit confusing. Uh, so this was a question uh, somebody wrote in about one of their co-workers who was uh, living with somebody that we called a roommate um, who had been diagnosed with COVID. And the question was around the amount of time that they were told to self-isolate. So uh, in this case, so the roommate, the person who has COVID uh, is meant to self-isolate for 10 days or for uh, until symptoms go away, whichever is longer. And the, 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 the person they live with, the person we're gonna call the coworker was told to isolate for the amount of time that the roommate isolated and also for an extra 14 days. So, um, and so this is a little bit confusing, but I, I, my understanding of this is that we're worried about the, what we call the incubation period of the virus. So that incubation period is the time between when you're exposed to virus and when you develop symptoms. So uh, the two people that are living together, one of them has COVID, the other does not. Um, and we don't know if the one who doesn't have it will get it or not, and when they'll get it. So um, the reason for the extra 14 days at the end is if the person who doesn't have COVID gets it at the very end of when the first person who has it um, is, is finishing up their symptoms, then that, that's, that, that um, person who just got it, the, the coworker, uh, could actually potentially transmit virus before they have symptoms and infect somebody else. I hope that makes sense. So that's why they have to isolate for another two weeks after uh, the person who actually has the symptoms. I don't know if that makes sense to everybody. Um, and there was a, the second part to that question was whether the person who wrote in, who had two hours worth of contact with a coworker, so not the person who had symptoms, whether they also needed to self-isolate. And the answer to that question is no, uh, unless that coworker does develop symptoms very quickly and at which point they would be contacted by public health. So that was a little bit convoluted, but <laughs> um, hopefully that made sense. Um, so that's all the questions about self-isolating. Thanks, Shauna. Thanks, Karen. I can't move on without addressing that uh, Ian has actually brought his own props. Ian, I'm not sure if there's anything more that you want to speak to in terms of people. Well, yes. So, Shauna, um, I see that there was a question in the chat box and uh, Dr. Reynolds, unfortunately, didn't know the answer. So here's the answer. This is how you avoid your glasses from steaming up. So as you'll see, I have donned my uh, my mask uh, i have sat the edge of my glasses just on the lip there so that they don't steam up and i can go and do my grocery shopping and life goes on and just to demonstrate taking it off you wouldn't necessarily need to take glasses off but grabbing it from behind your ears off it comes ready to go in the wash and I'll wash my hands and on with life thanks Shauna. This is more than just a webcast, it's fashion as well. Um, 
I'm going to actually turn it over to Nurse Alex next. Uh, we've had lots of calls from patients, uh, and even our, we ourselves are experiencing it. Um, we're all feeling the effect of physical distancing, of not being able to be close to the people we love and care about, and self-isolating. And Nurse Alex, I wonder if you have some strategies that you can share with us today to manage some of those things. Absolutely. So, I mean, certainly it's no surprise to anyone anywhere that COVID-19 has truly impacted the way we carry out uh, our everyday activities, you know, just from, you know, going and talking to your neighbors or grocery shopping. Um, you know, sometimes it's annoying, sometimes it's frustrating, and sometimes it is downright stressful. Uh, you know, I hear it from coworkers, I hear it from family, friends, and patients that I talk to every day. Um, they would all say exactly the same thing. And what I really want to talk to is the point that this you know, some level of stress or anxiety is absolutely 100% normal. You are not the only one. There is not a single person whose life, whose daily routine has not shifted um, because of COVID. But, you know, also on the flip side, you know, if you've turned on the TV, if you've, you know, uh, turned on the radio or been on social media, you see it everywhere that you know, it might sound hokey or you know, might hear it a lot, but it really is true that we really are in this together. And, you know, nobody is really exempt from some level of, of stress that, um, that this has caused us. Uh, and, you know, really this feeling of stress that we get, you know, to some degree in, in some level uh, of stress in itself can actually motivate us uh, in order to do things to care for ourselves. It's, it's what, you know, keeps us from shopping every single day and instead going once a week. It, um, you know, it, it keeps us, you know, to doing that physical distancing, it, that level of, you know, some level of stress is actually not a bad thing. So to reiterate, to have some level of stress is absolutely normal. I, or even to have a little bit of sense of grief or anger because it's, it's you know, changed your plans. Maybe you had a vacation planned or you know, you're really missing your, your everyday activities and that's all normal. Um, but the key is, is recognizing that stress and, and dealing with it and managing it. So yes, I do have some suggestions in terms of uh, how to manage the stress that many of us, in fact, all of us are experiencing. The first thing being is, you know, staying connected. So there's a couple of different ways you can do this. Uh, you know, the first part is, is being connected to your own social network. So, you know, whether that's your family, your friends, your coworkers. Uh, physical distancing does not mean social avoidance in, in its entirety. You can still touch base with, you know, the people in your household if you have them there. See how they're feeling about it. You can still pick up that phone, um, you know, or, you know, drop a text to family and friends. It could be just to, you know, drop a line and say, hi, how are you doing? Um, or it could be to commiserate really in terms of, you know, talking about how, how this is impacting you. Maybe how it's frustrating to go grocery shopping when you're following the arrows on the floor and trying to go the right direction, but other people are just kind of doing their own thing. But, you know, really, you know, it's, it's really, it's good for you, but it's also having, you know, that opportunity to reach out to other people really makes other people feel connected as well. And having that connection to something that's greater than the pandemic is so important because really things will eventually settle down. I know it feels like we're in it for the long haul, but things will, will eventually settle down. So keeping those connections is important. Um, but, you know, those are kind of those personal connections. But there's also those connections to your community. Um, you know, there's lots of ways to still uh, stay active and participate in your community. Perhaps before this all started, you know, maybe you were attending religious services, you were going to a group activity, you were attending AA meetings, um, and that doesn't have to stop. Um, Lots of organizations are doing things just like what we're doing and having, you know, private Zoom meetings or, you know, FaceTiming and staying connected. And it's it's really great way to, to stay connected to your community. Uh, you know, you can also support local businesses uh, that in your community that might be hurting. You know, it really helps them and it'll make you feel better. Maybe you can shop for a neighbor um, and pick up their groceries because they're isolating. Or, you know, maybe it's just raking the, lab the, the lawn of your, your neighbor who might not be able to do it themselves. Again, keeping that sense of community um, really just strengthens the entire community as a whole. 
One of the other suggestions uh, is to keep a routine. Having, you know, COVID kind of sometimes turn our lives upside down can make it really easy to get overwhelmed. So one of the recommendations is to, you know, keep a routine, keep a schedule. Doesn't mean that you, I mean, you can write it down if you want to, if you find that easiest to do, if you're not organized like me, or un I'm organ unorganized, but, um, or you can just do a mental checklist. Uh, but it's important, you know, to make sure that you're getting the appropriate amount of sleep, that you're, that you're eating at the same times that you normally would. Make sure that you're setting aside that time to, um, you know, to connect with your family, with your friends, with your community. And I really think that it's important to make sure that every day you're setting aside some time for an activity that brings you joy. So whether that's, you know, uh, doing a puzzle, reading a book, um, you can go on YouTube and learn a new activity. I know the big thing now is learning how to make sourdough bread. Um, but, you know, kind of there's no better time to do those things uh, uh, that, you know, that you didn't maybe get a chance to do that you can do at home. Like, as an example, my son's 12 and I'm just doing his baby book now. So, uh, you know, but it's, it's important to kind of keep things going because, you know, keeping a schedule reminds us that life does continue and it does go on and despite COVID and all the changes that it's brought. Um, and, you know, really, it also can really help us keep away from some of those unhealthy activities like overeating or over drinking because, you know, maybe that's how we're, we're, we're coping with that stress. I know I can't stay out of the pantry. So, you know, it really, it's important to make sure that you're keeping on schedule. And then my last recommendation would be, you know, to not overwhelm yourself with the news. Um, it is important to stay informed, absolutely. Um, you know, with those updates from Dr. Dina Hinshaw. Um, and, but make sure, you know, you're using reputable sources and limiting your media exposure. Keeping your TV tuned to any news network 24 seven can only, you know, serve to heighten any levels of, of stress. So, you know, those are some of the strategies I was recommending, but that being said, you know, it's certainly true that some of us do manage stress better than others. Uh, you know, this be, could be because of other stressors that you could be dealing with, uh, in, you know, such as a loss of job or de decreased income due to the, the um, financial effects of COVID. It might be just that you're really missing those social connections or perhaps even before COVID, you didn't really have a strong social uh, network and now you're feeling even more isolated. Uh, you know, perhaps you're already dealing with uh, depression or anxiety before this started. Or maybe you do have somebody in your life who's been diagnosed with COVID maybe hospitalized or maybe even has, you know, passed away from it. And it's during these times that it's really important um, to kind of monitor how you're coping and making sure you're reaching out. So it could be reaching out to family members, friends, a counselor. And, you know, I certainly strongly encourage you, if, you're, if you feel like you're not coping well, make sure you're reaching out to your medical health home at CVFP. You know, we're still open. We're still here to care for you. And our team members would be happy to set up a phone or virtual appointment so that you can touch base with your provider, whether it's physician or nurse practitioner, uh, so that you can discuss, um, you know, your mental health, because it, it certainly is important and relevant, and we want to keep you healthy, both physically and, and mentally. So whatever kind of resources or help that we can provide, please make sure you're reaching out. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to mention is that there's a lot of other kind of community supports that are available. Uh, there's an amazing a, um, Alberta Health Services website that lists so many of the great resources that are available. It's called Help in Tough Times. So if you uh, search it up on any web browser, Google, whatever it is, and you type in help in tough times, it should be the first result that pops up. And it has the most amazing kind of collection of resources. So it has great COVID information, uh, including the COVID screening tool. There's great mental health resources, addiction resources, stress and grief management, um, indigenous resources. So, you know, even if you feel like you're coping really well with things, I still encourage you to go check it out. Again, it's called Help in Tough Times. Um, and, it, you know, because if you look at it, maybe you might not need those resources, but perhaps somebody that, 
you um, that you talk with or that you are communicating with is having a bit of a harder time and you can direct them to those resources. Because, you know, as I said, you know, Shauna, we really are in this together. So I'm just encouraging people to make sure that they're reaching out to someone, you know, and if it's us, that would be great. Thanks, Alex. That's great. And, and I, I would echo everything Alex said about, we are here for you. So if you need anything, don't feel like you can only reach out to us if it's urgent. We're here. We're here to help you. We have a large team of the best health professionals waiting to, waiting to help you. On that note, we've had some questions about physicals, the annual physical, which we at CVFP call the periodic health exam. And can I still have mine? And how does that work exactly? Dr. Bucknell, do you want to take this question? Sure. Um, so good question. Um, I just want to, uh, so briefly, uh, historically, we used to always do these annual physicals, um, well, partly because we were trained that way. And uh, so we were supposed to, weren't we? And we all got used to doing it. Uh, unfortunately, there's very little evidence for benefit for that. Um, and so particular then um, asking the question, you know, should I still have my physical? Um, I would say um, the big question to ask is, does it make a difference? So if you have, uh, if you are not feeling well, please give us a call. If you have a significant health concern that cannot wait, please give us a call. If you are really feeling sort of kind of the same or actually feeling very well, you say, well, it's just time. At this point, it's very difficult to actually do the routine labs. The lab is asking us not to send people to the lab unless there's something acute happening right now. So we can't do the routine lab things. Um, you know, do you need, uh, do you have high blood pressure, heart disease? Should somebody check your blood pressure? Well, if you have a machine at home, you can certainly uh, check it at home and, and uh, email that, that you know, email us the numbers or call us with the result. That would be great. Um, but if it's a routine matter, we do ask that you wait and possibly several months and maybe until quite a bit later, maybe in the fall, we recognize that eventually we do need to get these things done. So eventually I do want to know what your you know, blood pressure has been. Uh, oh, you know, you're on blood pressure medications. Should we you know, check some labs again? What are you, what's your kidney function doing? Um, or what about things like mammograms and pap tests and these kind of things? So uh, we don't want to forget about things altogether. On the other hand, in the current situation, we also don't want to have more traffic in the office and particularly more traffic in the labs and the x-ray places where those tests are done. So because a delay in a few weeks and a few months really does not make a difference, um, that is why we're asking that those kinds of things be delayed. So um, an annual physical, um, to some extent, it doesn't sometimes have to be a physical at all. So if it really is just a health review, well, we're quite happy to, you know, let's do a, a telephone call or video conference and go over things and make sure you're up to date on and, you know, talk about when should we be doing some of these routine tests. Certainly happy to do that. Um, I know that I've done that even just today, um, spoke with a, a person. Uh, and we did a very detailed review of medications and health history and when should we be doing which labs and are we up to date and, and we can certainly do that. Um, but uh, things like lab testing, things like uh, physical exam measures, if they are truly just routine measures, uh, A, sometimes are they actually needed in any case and, so, and oftentimes they're not, but certain ones could be very relevant, but there we do ask that we delay this by likely several months because you also recognize if your condition has been the same for several years and we're just sort of keeping an eye on things, a delay of several months does not make a difference and it'd be better to just leave it until things are more settled and it's safer. On the other hand, I do wanna encourage this. If you are having new symptoms, if you are not feeling well, if you have concerns that are new and different, please pick up the phone and call us so we can review that with you. Do you need to be seen in person? Possibly, if so, let's make that happen. Or perhaps we can review things together over the phone and talk about what factors go into it. You might not need to be seen, but we still want to hear. If there's something acute going on, something new, some concern you have, please call. But the routine matters, um, the, the same conditions that have been going on over years, or simply just health screening, I'm actually healthy, um, we do want to put those things off. Um, you know, age uh, does make a bit of a difference here. Um, 
you know, if you are a healthy 28 year old, um, we, there's really no evidence that a, an annual physical makes any difference anyway. Um, so, um, you know, let's put that off. I don't think we need to necessarily see you. Um, but if you do have, you know, if you're older, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, you have diabetes, high blood pressure, maybe some asthma and those kind of conditions, we don't want to leave that forever. So we don't want to put you off and, uh, you know, we don't want to minimize those concerns because yes, we want to look after you, but if you're feeling okay and stable, if we can delay it a while, weeks to months, that would be great. But certainly please do call if you have a new concern, if you're not doing well, please give us a shout. Thanks, Shana. Thanks, Chris. Ian, I think you wanted to jump in and share the international perspective. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, and I think some of my patients will, will recognize that I'm sounding like a broken record here because they've heard all this before, but uh, you'll tell from my funny accent, I'm not from around here, and uh, I'll reassure you that the annual physical is a North American phenomenon. Um, they don't do them in the UK, Australia, New Zealand. You know what? The people of those countries are doing fine. So not having an annual physical is you're not missing out. The College of Family Physicians now calls it a periodic health exam, which is exactly what Chris just described, is we check in routinely every now and again, depending on what's going on with you. So don't panic that we haven't done your annual physical, and most of it is a conversation that can absolutely happen over the phone. So I look forward to talking to you all about them soon. Excellent, thanks Ian. Um, I'm gonna pivot uh, quite a bit here. We've had some questions about uh, COVID and specifically the mortality data. Uh, we actually haven't heard from our pharmacist, Esmond, tonight. And Esmond, I'm wondering if you could talk to us a bit about uh, the mortality data. Sure, absolutely. Um, so just give me one second. I'm gonna share my screen with everyone. And oops, I need to move this around. Okay, there we go. Everyone can see that, right? Yeah, okay, wonderful. So yeah, um, I had some questions about mortality. And uh, so this is Alberta data. You can find this if you just Google uh, COVID stats Alberta. And you can see here that it has number of cases, the hospitalizations, ICU, and, and uh, the mortality, the death rate. Uh, there's a big bump in this 40 to 49 year old year old range because of the meat packing plants. It was a large number of cases there and so that bumped up this number. But as you can see, it was the 80 plus year uh, age group that had more, uh, more cases than anyone else, any other age group. And so um, sometimes when we're, you know, it's kind of fearful time for COVID, but sometimes just looking at the numbers can bring a little bit of uh, reassurance. So looking at the age group, you can see the amount of hospitalizations, the cases, and the amount of mortality. So now I'm going to move to Canada. So this is the Canada-wide data. You can find this if you Google, if you Google uh, COVID stats Canada. And let's see here. Oops, sorry, just having a little bit of trouble finding this. There you go. And you can see the stats for all of Canada. Again, you can see that the 80 plus range had the most uh, mortality cases and more cases than all the other age groups combined. Yeah. Okay. Oops. And yeah, so this was the mortality data. And this is from the CDC for the United States. This is their data and on this uh, website, you can see that they also included stats for influenza and pneumonia and combined cases. Again, similar data to Canada where uh, the 80 plus years, 80 plus years had the most uh, mortality. Okay, and so uh, did, we also had some questions on stroke and uh, chronic conditions. So as you can see here that uh, for mortality, People with uh, comorbidities have a higher uh, uh, mortality rate. Uh, cardiovascular was the highest, followed by diabetes. So if you do have a comorbidity, you need to be extra careful. Uh, there was also some uh, research out of New York saying that there was increases in, this, in the rate of stroke. And so there seems to be two, two factors in that. 
One is that, uh, yes, they're showing that uh, this, th this virus, the COVID, uh, may have some uh, increased coagu coagulopathy. It means, it, it means it, uh, increased blood clotting. And it, but that's kind of uh, undergoing research. They did show that uh, looking at past data for the SARS data, that the virus also had increased uh, coagulation there as well. So that's one, one part of it. The other part that the New York uh, uh, data showed that the, the physicians who published this data in New York, they felt that also people were um, really afraid to go to hospital and not going until they were really, really severe. Uh, in, the, in, in looking at the cases, it showed that uh, it was the severe people who had the most uh, chance of stroke. And so how do we, how do we protect ourselves? So uh, it would just be like all the things that all the other speakers were talking about, trying to eat healthy, keeping mentally healthy. Uh, Dr. Johnston was talking about physical distancing, using a mask and those things, uh, you know, exercising. Those are things that you could do to protect yourself from COVID and, and, and the stroke. Yeah. So hello, everybody, again. Apologies for this. Um, uh, maybe viruses exist in more than just the environment, but in our computers or certainly in the way we try to uh, create these networks. Um, we lost um, the tail end of uh, the previous presentation. And so we wanted to just recreate some of the information because some of you had questions. And so we certainly want to answer those. Um, the, uh, so Esmond had presented some, some data on, on uh, mortality and where you can get that. So um, the, the next question we wanted to talk about um, was um, really in the context of someone who was older, who had a uh, history of, of severe asthma uh, and was wondering, um, would uh, supplementation with zinc reduce the risk? Um, now, uh, that's a, it's a good question because this is something I've actually looked at in the past myself for my own cold symptoms when I have colds, and I do get those occasionally. Um, but then I, I revisited the, the research a little bit based on that question. Now, the interesting thing is this. There is some evidence that taking zinc supplementation can shorten the course of the common cold. As is usual in medical science, there are some studies that suggest there's no difference and there are some studies that say, in fact, yes, it can make a difference. It can shorten it to some extent. Um, unfortunately, the studies that suggest that there may be a benefit um, um, talk about doses that are quite high, 75 milligrams. Um, when I looked at my Jamieson brand um, lozenge, and you probably have something similar if you've looked at the shelf, um, uh, those are 10 milligrams. So I would have to take seven or eight lozenges a day um, to, to achieve that in, in a common cold. Uh, the tricky thing is that um, uh, zinc, uh, zinc supplementation can unfortunately make you feel nauseated. Uh, and so if you were to take seven or eight lozenges of zinc uh, every day, um, you might feel quite ill. No nausea is one of the symptoms of COVID. So, um, you know, that could be quite confusing. So I'm not sure what really the net benefit is, but there is indeed some research that suggests that that's the case. There's also research in a test tube that suggests that coronaviruses as a family, um, and COVID is a corona type virus, um, that in a test tube, replication of the virus can be impaired with zinc supplementation. Um, there again, that does not specifically say that if you take COVID, if you take zinc for COVID, it'll work. Um, but there's a theory there anyway, um, that it might be helpful. Um, but again, very high dose. It, the research is done on the common cold, not COVID itself, although COVID is a coronavirus and some colds are caused by coronaviruses, maybe about 15% of them or so. Um, the really important thing is this. You might find zinc sprays, nasal sprays on the shelf. Do not use zinc nasal sprays. Unfortunately, people who use zinc nasal sprays and, and in some instances will have caused permanent loss of smell. So if you're going to use zinc, the evidence, there's maybe something there a little bit, but it's, it, there's some certain lim there's limitations. As a lozenge, that might be okay. You might get queasy, but please do not spray zinc up your nose because that can lead to permanent damage. In terms of um, elderly, uh, maybe some other illnesses on board, asthma. So 
um, the concern is, look, am I doomed if I get COVID? Am I going to die? I, I absolutely understand what the concern would be there. Um, on the other hand, the numbers do suggest that the majority of people who are older and the majority of people who have asthma actually do okay. You might need to be in hospital. Many people do not need to be in hospital. So still, most of the people do not have the really severe illness. The chance is a little higher that you would get severe illness. And we see that from number, numbers. But it doesn't mean that absolutely every time if you get COVID now, you're going to get really severe illness. That is not the case. However, if you have an underlying chronic illness, and this is maybe one of my sort of key points as well, let's make sure that any underlying chronic illness right now is treated maximally. So if you have asthma and you're, you, you feel you are really well controlled with the medication, that's great. If you're not sure, if you have asthma, if you have diabetes, you know, what's your blood pressure like, all these things. If you, you feel you're not well controlled right now, please contact us because we are here and this is what we want to do. We want to make sure that your underlying illnesses are treated to the best of our ability so that should you get ill with COVID, hopefully not, but if you do, that we want to make sure that we can get the best outcomes. And that is why now, before you get sick, maximizing treatment. Lynn, I think you might speak a bit about vaccine development. Okay, so um, yeah, we had a few questions about uh, vaccine, reinfection, uh, carrier, that kind of um, thing. So I'll just uh, be quick um, trying to answer these. This is not an area of expertise of mine. So um, <clears throat> just so what I did was just rely on uh, specialists' um, opinions um, from webinars and, and what the evidence to date seems to show. So there continues um, so far to, uh, to be no evidence that relapse or early reinfection from COVID-19 occurs. Uh, there was a question about mutation. Um, COVID-19 is an RNA virus, which means it is capable of mutation. Uh, and would that um, then, I think the question was kind of around, uh, does that make it harder to treat um, down the road? And uh, again, um, COVID-19 has only been around uh, for us as, um, in the in our population for about four to five months which is not a long time at all and there is research specialists um, are looking at all the numbers looking at statistics looking at comorbidities uh, um, so there's tons of research going on all across the globe and in time a vaccine will likely be developed uh, um, but time is the um, essence here, so or time is the important factor here that uh, we need way more than four to five months. There's been some suggestions that, or comments, I guess, about um, a, a vaccine being ready as early as six to 18 months. Um, infectious disease specialists, uh, microbiologists would suggest that that's highly, highly optimistic and, and, and likely not realistic at all. Um, that, you know, first the development of the vaccine has to occur and then you have to also go through stages of testing uh, um, uh, for safety as well as, um, as uh, efficacy. So uh, it, it's a while away. So we're going to be in this situation of washing hands and, and um, using other means to stay safe for some time. Um, there was also a question about carriers, uh, and so studies to date suggest that uh, people that become infected with the virus, although we can see asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic um, pre patients, that um, people do still become symptomatic with this virus, and they do not develop antibodies and go on to be carriers um, to everybody else. They, the, the studies also show that after an illness, um, when, uh, when patients are retested, they, we can find RNA, uh, meaning there's, shows that there has been presence of the virus, but that actual live virus eight to 10 days later uh, is, is not actually present. So 
Um, so right now, and I mean, maybe as things continue, that will change. But right now, it those are some concerns that um, I would try to suggest to uh, just put aside and uh, um, and just, I guess, time will tell with most of that. Uh, Somebody is going to talk about the Alberta tracer. Is that going to be you, Ian? Yeah, so I can I can speak to that. So Dr. Siegel did a, a much more eloquent job than I'm about to of explaining uh, the app. But so essentially, this is a an app that uses Bluetooth, which is basically a way for my phone to talk to someone else's phone if they are within two meters of me. So it's going back to that um, that study that I, I mentioned and Lynn described where it was healthcare workers two meters apart for 15 minutes. That app is basically gonna click if you guys are close together for that length of time. So it's probably gonna matter if you're like in a workplace, it's probably not gonna matter if you're two meters apart in the grocery store checkout, but it, that's how it's gonna work. Now, I know that there's a few problems, particularly with the Apple one at the moment, as I said earlier, the public health guys assure us this is going to get fixed. And um, so, you know, we're probably gonna be needing this for quite a long time. So there may, it's, it's okay for it to have teething troubles. People have raised some uh, some privacy concerns. Really, anytime you Google something, so all the stuff you've been Googling about COVID over the last uh, few weeks, you've been sharing a lot more of your personal information with Google and uh, Facebook and all of these other platforms than this app is gonna collect. It's, got, it's gonna get your phone number and it's got so many levels of encryption on it that that phone number ain't gonna go anywhere. So I would not spend any time worrying about the, about the security of it, the security of your other um, data in other ways is way, 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 um, way worse protected. So don't worry about that. This is how we're going to get our communities back up and out uh, the door once again. So it's something we really, uh, really need to, to use. Um, I think that's all I have on the app. So I, I know that Shauna uh, did a sort of quick round table at the end with some, some final pearls. So I'm going to hand back to Chris, if I may, and say, Chris, what was your final COVID pearl for the evening before we sign off? Um, yeah, um, I think the, the main messages would be, um, um, firstly, um, if you have chronic illnesses now, we are here, let's maximize treatment so that you are well, just in case you do get exposed to the virus. So please do not hesitate, don't wait. Uh, if you are feeling fine, um, we don't need to do routine testing, you know, regular annual physicals, any of that kind of thing. Uh, but if you have a current concern, please do call us. And if you have a chronic underlying illness that you feel may be controlled better, please work with us. Um, quick comment about the app as well. The way it works is that if uh, you won't, you won't notice anything. Uh, you turn on the app, you leave it on and you just do go about your, your regular activity. Um, what will happen is that if somebody that you might have been for, you know, it, it, within two meters for 15 minutes, if somebody gets tested positive, then public health can call you and say, by the way, and this is confidential, you don't know who the person was who might be positive, but they could call you and say, hey, you actually were in contact potentially with a person who was positive. Do you need to be tested? Do you have symptoms? That sort of thing. So um, you won't notice anything about the app. The app will not uh, tell you when somebody is who has COVID is within two meters. It is after the fact, if you have been exposed, it is a way of tracking that illness. That's the purpose of it. Um, and the public health people on, on Monday evening as well said, if we want to go back, the, the sooner we want life to return to a more normal, the more we have to do now to prevent spreading. And this app is a key next element in tracking the illness and controlling it and knowing who might have been exposed. So that, so the more we do this, the faster we can go back to more normal lives. And so that's why we're encouraging everybody to download the, uh, the app, uh, turn it on, leave it on. It won't tell you anything, but if you've been in contact per chance, then this is one way of finding that and uh, keeping everybody um, safe that way as much as we can. And this is simply the next step and a very key element from public health for us to be doing. Um, Lynn, any final final words around pearls? Uh, so I, I will reiterate yet again, um, 
the, the app, um, it is only going to work if the majority of people have it, just like vac that's how vaccinations work. Um, we need, uh, I guess, the other countries that have it, 20% um, of their population have uh, uh, downloaded or using it, and that's not enough. We need to get up to 80%. So download it, send it to your friends, um, and then the other piece, uh, wash hands. That's going to work for a very long time, forever. That's it. Ian. Thanks, Lynn. So I am going to, sorry, I just need to click something. Yeah, there we go. Um, so I'm just going to try and uh, finish off. Uh, so before I, I do my final part, I just wanted to start with some some thanks. Uh, going going all the way up to, to Dr. Dina Hinshaw, I think she's been doing a phenomenal job. There's a, a, a young lad called Jahu, who's the um, local public health lead in Calgary. Guy's been doing a phenomenal job. And then clo closer to home, I, I want to say a sincere thanks to Dr. Janet Reynolds, our, our clinic colleague, who uh, has been really leading the charge within the clinic. She's our medical director, but she also wears another hat as the, the primary care network medical director. So I, I don't know when Janet's been sleeping, to be honest, because she's been drinking from a fire hose with all of this information that's been coming to us. Uh, in addition, Dr. Rick Ward wears another hat as um, one of the, the AHS leaders in primary care. And uh, again, just doing phenomenal stuff at uh, various levels to try and keep everyone safe and make sure we're all uh, pulling in the right direction. I should specifically call out um, again Janet and Shauna and Corinne and one of our nurses Sarah who uh, have been working tirelessly meeting for uh, every, every single day really for the last couple of months uh, as a, a basically response team within the clinic making sure that we're responding to new information and keeping all of the all of the patients safe, all of the staff safe. And uh, really, I'm so fortunate that I work where I do because we've been just doing such a phenomenal job with that team behind us uh, in keeping everyone safe. And so, so, um, so thank you to all of you. And then finally, thank you to the patients and to the rest of the community who, who aren't obviously with, within CVFP, because you're the ones that have really made so many sacrifices to flatten this curve. Uh, and hopefully we just need to keep it flat. That's the key thing. So that app, as Chris said, is is really key to making this next step. It's taking technology uh, that we didn't have 20, 30 years ago to be able to, to take public health um, to the next level where we can find people before they even know that they're infected and get them uh, self-isolated, get them tested, get anyone else tested. And that's how we will get ahead, get ahead and stay ahead of this. Viruses are not smart. Viruses are just, they're, they're not even alive. They require us to, uh, to, to keep alive. So we can, we can beat them. We just need to be smart. And so smart technology is there to help us. Uh, we just don't need to be scared of it. It's not, track. I should add, it's not tracking your location. It's not one of these GPS things. It is, it, the government does not know where you are. <laughs> you know where you are. Um, it does not, so do not worry. And then my final peril, wash your hands. All infectious diseases hate it when we wash our hands. So if we wash our hands, life will go on. Um, I think that's it. So I'm going to say thank you to everyone for bearing with our technology uh, glitches and uh, stay safe. Come see us, call us. We're here to look after you uh, and good night.